Thanks for joining us on Capitol View. I'm Fred Martino. This week, we begin with a look back at the legislative work completed last year and a look ahead to the next meeting of the Illinois General Assembly. I am very pleased to welcome Senator Terry Bryant of Illinois Senate District 58. Senator, thank you so much for being with us today. Well, thank you, Fred, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. It's been a little while since I've been on WSIU uh, TV, so uh, thank you for having me. Well, it is great to have you with us, and I, I want to start with uh, kind of a big question, but just I, I do this very often to try to get uh, reflections on 2023. Your thoughts on the biggest accomplishment, accomplishments of the year? Uh, well, so I, I think there are several. Um, on a personal note, first of all, this is my first uh, time as serving in leadership. So uh, this past year, I was appointed as the assistant minority leader. I think that's good for the 58th Senate District because it gives us a louder voice. Uh, quite often, leaders are uh, approached more often, and there's a little bit more weight uh, to the things that they say. So I think that's good for we in Southern Illinois. Uh, uh, so on a personal note, that uh, was true. Uh, you know that my wheelhouse, if you will, or my history has been the Illinois Department of Corrections. And so uh, I would say uh, really over the last three years, but in particular this past year, we saw a real change with the Prison Review Board. Uh, Senator McClure, Senator Plummer and I uh, served uh, on the Executive Appointments Committee and uh, multiple times we saw real problems at the Prison Review Board. One being that it was a 14 member board and at one time, I think there were only five people appointed to that board. And so it was almost impossible for them to function. Uh, at one time, there were multiple members that we, we were hoping were not going to get confirmed. In one case, there was an appointee uh, who, uh, had, was actually, who actually was voting to release someone from prison while that prison review board member had served time in that same prison. Mm -hmm. So you can see that there were, uh, there were and there were a multitude prob of problems beyond that. I serve in a super duper minority. And so quite often um, we're confronted with the fact that we don't have the votes to do some of the things that we would like to do. But what we do have is a really strong voice. And so because of that, and, um, and I was uh, in the forefront of this particular issue with the Prison Review Board, we were able to uh, keep three individuals from being confirmed. That's nearly impossible for a minority party. We also were able to get the governor to make better appointments to the board. And I think we've seen a move in, the, uh, in, in a direction that is certainly more victim uh, related uh, rather than being um, what I would term very soft on crime, very soft on criminals, and taking a little bit harder look at victims. So I'm super proud of that. All right. Well, tell us about some of the most important issues that you're still working on for 2024. Uh, I, so we were just asked, actually, we Republicans were just asked to give a priority list to the Democrat leadership. And so it's pretty easy to, because I've already thought this through a lot. I have um, one particular bill that has not been filed yet, uh, so I don't have a bill number for it, but the genesis of this bill actually started in the House. I was not aware of it. It's, it's called Faith's Bill. Um, Senator, or, I'm sorry, uh, Representative Amy Ellick has been working with a victim uh, in the House. It has to do with 18-year-olds who are still in high school who are, um, have sexual relations with a teacher or a school employee. Presently, if, a, if someone is seven, like 17 or under and that happens, there is actually a felony charge. But if this student is 18 or older, the, the school employee might be fired, but there's actually no ability to charge that individual with a crime. Amy Ellick, uh, Representative Ellick has been working on that in the House. It was brought to my attention by uh, uh, an educator in Benton, but also I have what's called the Youth Advisory Council. So it's high schoolers from all over the district. I meet with twice a year. 
they um, determine during our Youth Advisory Council what issue is most important to them. They, we split them up in five different groups, then they debate with each other and they choose one bill that they would like to see me carry in the next cycle. This is the bill. Hmm. And so it is my intention to have a bill that uh, mirrors, uh, right now, if you work in the Department of Corrections, Department of Human Services, if you're a doctor, if you're an attorney, you cannot have sexual relations with those who you have custodial care or responsibility over. I don't care if a student is 18, 19, or 20 years old, they're still students. And that educator has the ability to lower grades, to create uh, disciplinary issues, and that can have an effect on scholarship money, on all kinds of things in that person's future. I think it warrants a, a felony charge. And so I'm gonna be working with the House members who are already running this in conjunction with victims and in conjunction with my Youth Advisory Council. That's my number one priority for this next year. Okay, very interesting and uh, interesting to hear that that was something that uh, students identified as a priority that you work with. As you know, Senator, uh, there is a lot of concern about the increasing cost of care for asylum seekers in Chicago. What would you like to see in regard to this? Well, I think the first thing that has to happen, because um, immigration is a federal issue, and that being said, I think we saw um, very good results, regardless of where an individual is in, uh, on the issue of President Trump. The Remain in Mexico policy worked in order to curb uh, the, uh, uh, the crossings at the border. Uh, as WSIU, you know that there is a huge number of immigrants in the Carbondale area that are Pakistani and Indian and many other cultures, many other nationalities who are waiting in line for 30, 50, I even heard 90 years one time for someone to get a green card because of our, our uh, federal policies. So it isn't just a matter of those who are coming across the border, the southern border, or even the northern border for that fact. It's a, it's a terrible federal policy that we are um, having in place right now. So first thing to do would be to close the border in a way that allows us to sort out the claims of asylum seekers first. But what has happened in Illinois um, with the policies that we have here in Illinois is we have out a welcome mat all over the world that says, come to Illinois, because here they can actually get free medical care, just as an example. Um, for instance, if you are a a uh, naturalized citizen of Illinois, which one of my best friends is a Nicaraguan naturalized citizen now. She, if she, if she needed to get Medicaid in Illinois, she would fall under um, a managed care system. So your doctor has to be pre-approved, hospital pre-approved, and your procedure pre-approved. But right now, asylum seekers fall under a different method, right? So those Medicaid recipients are under fee for service. No pre-approval for the doctor, no pre-approval for the hospital, 100% paid for, and that is for ages 42 and above. And it's also for those who fall under all kids. And so right now, regardless of what's happening at the border or who is being shipped to Illinois from another state, the welcome mat is open. I mean, it's, it's out there. The welcome mat is out and the come to Illinois sign is up. And we're gonna see a, a real problem with our budget in fiscal 2024. And that policy is a big part of what we're gonna see as a problem with our budget. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, certainly uh, the other issue is the hundreds of millions of dollars for uh, care for asylum seekers. Some have asked uh, around the country, not just uh, in the Chicago mayor, but in Denver, in New York City, have asked the federal government to step up to spend more uh, for these expenses. Uh, are you, in your view, looking at this, are you seeing enough action to get that done? 
Well, so again, because it's the federal government's responsibility to maintain the border, it, it is their responsibility to fund those needs. But to play devil's advocate here in this, it's still taxpayer money. So whether you take it out of the left pocket or the right pocket, it's still taxpayer money. And okay. so the problem has to be addressed. And there are some issues that you can't just keep throwing money at. And this okay. is one of those. You know, in, in regard to, to budget and money issue, you said hundreds of millions. But in fiscal 2023, uh, Illinois budget had, I think it was $250 million budgeted for this program. We spent over 900 million. And in fiscal 2024, uh, the Pritzker administration acknowledged that 250 million wasn't enough. So in this year's budget, there's just over 500 million just in that Medicaid issue. But we're anticipating, we were anticipating 1.1 billion. Now we're thinking that it might be as much as $2 billion in spending. So while we had a so-called $200 million surplus in this year's budget, if you have a $1.5 billion hole, there's no surplus. You gotta find that money somewhere. The governor's already went in and, and taken money away from DCFS to throw at this problem. DCFS, for God's sake, of all the places to, you know, to, to sweep money from, that's a place not to sweep it from. So this is going to be an ongoing issue. Absolutely. And certainly on a previous uh, episode of this program, we also noted that the city of Chicago now is using uh, money that was allocated uh, for COVID relief. Uh, to deal with care for asylum seekers. You've already noted that in the next fiscal year, there is projected to be a massive budget deficit, hundreds of millions of dollars. In addition to the asylum issue and the ongoing medical care issue, which is separate, uh, what else do you think should be done in the next session of the General Assembly to deal with this budget deficit? Um, well, first, let me give you one more deficit issue that we're going to have, and then I think I can address both of those possibly. We think that we might have as much as a $200 million deficit in school funding, and that is because as the asylum seekers uh, come into Illinois, they have, to be, they have to be allowed to be in schools. They're allowed to be in schools. So our local school districts are going to be footing the bill for that, and you know where the money comes from for that. It's in property taxes. So I think not only are we talking about an issue with the state budget, but we're also talking about what are these, uh, I, I represent more than 50 school districts in the 58th Senate district, uh, public school districts. Where's that money gonna come from? Because they don't have it now. And it's only gonna, it seems that it's only gonna get worse as we move forward. So, um, to address the issues, I'm not somebody who believes that we should be throwing money at things. Number one is you, uh, Governor Pritzker said that on the issue of asylum seekers, that he was going to come back to the committee known as JCAR, which is the committee that makes rules. Whenever we pass laws, each agency has to come up with rules for how that will be implemented, and they have to go to JCAR to get approval for those rules or to get emergency rules approved. The governor said that he was going to go to JCAR and he was going to actually implement uh, this managed care aspect rather than fee for service. And he was also going to put um, uh, um, some means testing in there. So how much money is this person making uh, so that there would be like a copay, for instance, uh, that hasn't happened. And so first, I think Governor Pritzker has to do the things that he promised the legislature and those who voted for the budget, he promised them that he was going to do because he hasn't done that yet. So I would say let's start with that. Senator Terry Bryant, you can watch that entire interview on WSIU TV's YouTube channel. 
and we'd like to hear from you. Email us anytime. The address is contact at WSIU.org. Analysis now, and we welcome Alex Degman of WBEZ and Hannah Meisel of Capital News Illinois. Alex, up front this week, as we've reported, a new Illinois law banning assault weapons is being challenged in court. The U.S. Supreme Court denied one request to review the ban, but the court could take up another challenge later this year. The law allows current owners to keep the guns with a requirement, registration. But the Chicago Sun-Times reports it appears most Illinois owners of assault weapons have not registered the guns as required by law. Tell us more. One of the biggest components of the Protect Illinois Communities Act that went into effect January 1st is this online registry. In order to keep your assault style rifles and uh, attachments that you had before January 1st, by law, you're required to do this. But the Sun-Times reported that as of the first week, I, I think it was roughly between 1 and 2 percent of Floyd card holders, uh, about 29,000 or so registered 69,000 items. And that's a lot. There, there are a lot more guns than that in Illinois that haven't been registered. So people are just not doing this, not be, and it's basically because they don't want to. Uh, they're mad for a couple of reasons, and one of those is that they still aren't sure what the final rules are going to be surrounding this registry. Uh, they're still hammering that out in the Joint Committee on Administrative Rules. Uh, they're governed under emergency rules right now, but the final rules are likely to be a little bit different. They're concerned about a few things like, for example, how much latitude should state police get to define an assault weapon? Uh, they say copycat manufacturers could come up with you know, entirely new weapons that mimic AR-15s, but they're actually not. So they would skirt the law. How do you deal with that? And then there's the constitutional aspect of uh, the Supreme Court. You mentioned the, uh, the state court case with Dan Calkins earlier this week, but they also declined to issue a stay last month on Second, on second Amendment grounds. So the law took effect and they, that could still come up because there are a number of federal lawsuits that are in the that are in the works right now that are challenging the law on Second Amendment grounds. It's fascinating. There have even been some comments by candidates in Republican primary battles mentioning the registration requirement and saying publicly they will not comply and challenging their opponents to do the same. So this is, is truly something and uh, again, like so many laws today, uh, we are going to have to wait for the courts uh, to, to get involved, to really drive home the point uh, in terms of, of paying attention. And it'll be fascinating as time goes on to see if more uh, assault uh, weapon owners comply uh, with the registration requirements. So thank you for updating us on that. Uh, it, was a, it was a great story in the uh, Chicago Sun-Times, your partner uh, there at WBEZ. Hannah, you recently reported a story about former House Speaker Michael Madigan. His bribery and racketeering trial was set to begin, ironically, April 1st, but that has been delayed. That's right. Uh, it's six month delay till October the eighth. It's very rarely that you, uh, on you know, three days into the year, you watch your plan for the year kind of blow up in front of you. But uh, that's what happened when I was, uh, you know, in the federal courtroom last week, uh, watching um, uh, U.S. District Judge John Blakey say, "Yes, we will wait. Uh, this is because of." a matter that the U.S. Supreme Court is looking at that deals with the same federal bribery statutes, basically asking, you know, does a quid pro quo agreement need to be in place for it to count as bribery, uh, you know, for that to be illegal? Um, and so that uh, the court is expected to hear that case this upcoming spring and, uh, you know, is expected to rule on it by summer. Um, really interesting kind of issues there. And, uh, you know, the judge said, basically, we don't want to do this twice. Um, you know, defense team, you're right. We don't want to have to um, do this all over, um, you know, because on this current schedule, we would have probably reached a verdict uh, around June. And then a few weeks later, the court would have ruled, um, you know, this 
was also very interesting because uh, House Speaker Mike Madigan, who's been out of power for uh, nearly three years now, um, he appeared in public for the first time, uh, you know, since I can remember. And I want to say that he appeared in a, you know, local public event in the summer of 2021. And that's basically the last time I've seen him do anything publicly. Of course, he was indicted in March of 2022 and has not been, uh, you know, required to show up for court since then. And in fact, last week, he wasn't required to show up in court. He had the option to appear via, via video conference. But uh, a guy who famously eschewed cell phones and emails, I guess it's not surprising that he chose to just show up for court. All right. Well, we'll keep watching that one. Very interesting. And it could, of course, depending on the rulings, have an effect on uh, other cases down the line. Alex, a new director has been named for the Illinois Department of Children and Family Services. You reported on efforts to fix what the headline calls decades of systemic issues. Yeah, and the appointment of the new director is another step in a long line of uh, things that DCFS is doing to try to right the ship, as it were. I mean, this agency has been around since the 1960s, and, been, and people have been shouting about systemic problems there since the 1980s when the ACLU of Illinois filed suit and uh, basically alleging that kids that are under the care of the state are not getting taken care of, and that led to the federal consent decree in the 90s, which, depending on who you talk to, the state has not been in compliance with it since then. Um, the systemic issues continued through the 2000s, and they finally hit ahead in about 2009 when Governor Pat Quinn tried to cut the budget and the federal court had to step in and say, no, you can't do that because if you do, you're not going to be able to pay for the things required as part of the consent decree. And then that started, you know, about a decade of either steady funding or slightly declining funding. And in, in there, you include a budget impasse and the state lost a bunch of shelter capacity. And it was just not a very good situation. It's still not. But when you had Governor J.B. Pritzker come in, that's when he appointed Mark Smith, who was the director for four and a half years. There was finally some stability in that role, in addition to consistently increasing funding. You look at the funding levels from fiscal year 19 to fiscal year 24, where we are now, and they've doubled. The funding levels have doubled. Staffing levels, especially among frontline staff workers, are increasing. I think uh, at, in the doldrums in fiscal year 19, there were about 2,600 employees. And now the headcount is uh, between 34 and 3,500. They are making some pretty significant strides to right the ship but there are still a lot of problems that Mark Smith had to deal with during his tenure. You might remember quite famously that he was held in contempt of court a dozen times or more because there were children with uh, developmental uh, issues and like they kids that were in need that were languishing in settings that were not appropriate for them. Yeah. Those yeah. issues, th those are, those are part of the issues, but then the new director, uh, Heidi Miller comes from the Illinois department of juvenile justice and talking to people about her, um, they're really optimistic. She comes from IDJJ, where she spearheaded a plan to change the way youth who are incarcerated are cared for, uh, going from the big institutionalized uh, settings to smaller, more uh, intimate settings, I suppose. And then people say that she is willing to think outside the box. She's a collaborative thinker. And people complain that DCFS is one of those, this is the way we've always done at agencies, but combined with the uh, technological upgrades they're getting and the new director and the steady funding, uh, advocates are hopeful that things are going to start to or things are going to continue to go in the right direction at DCFS. All right. Well, thanks for that update. We will be watching. Uh, and another reminder of the importance of uh, journalism in oversight uh, on an agency there. Hannah, finally, uh, Capital News Illinois reported on a new state program designed to help with a shortage of substance abuse counselors. Got a couple of minutes left. Tell us about that. Yes, I'd like to give credit to our postgraduate fellow, Dilpreet Raju, who uh, pursued this story. Uh, that's one of his uh, interests. And basically, you know, in the last five years in Illinois, we've had record overdose deaths. I think this is an issue we have not heard, uh, you know, more about for a confluence of reasons. 
Uh, you know, COVID, of course, was the big story. But, you know, if, if that wouldn't have happened, you know, maybe we would have paid more attention to this, you know, continuing epidemic of overdose deaths. Um, you know, the last year that data is available, more than 3,000 people died of an opioid involved over overdose in Illinois, uh, whereas, you know, in that year, uh, nearly 2,000 people were killed by firearms. It is the leading cause of uh, death um, in Illinois. It, this is a $3 million program. Um, it's a partnership with the Department of Human Services. Uh, because Illinois' behavioral health, health counselor workforce is aging uh, while new entrants are declining. And, you know, this is a dire need that they have. And of course, Alex had mentioned, you know, the effect of the budget impasse uh, still has on the Department of uh, Children and Family Services, uh, wherein, you know, we've lost so much capacity in shelters and other uh, places where kids can go. Um, you know, same thing in this uh, area. We, you know, you can't just snap your fingers and build back up the workforce. So that's what this program aims to do. It gives uh, stipends up to $7,500 for internships, a um, $1,000 bonus if you join uh, after you're certified a state, um, you know, approved a place that does this drug and alcohol counseling. And, you know, so that people are hopeful uh, that this uh, program will make a dent. And I wouldn't uh, be surprised if it's extended beyond its June uh, deadline to expire. Will be very interesting to see. That is, of course, a, a huge national problem, not just a problem in Illinois. Uh, and certainly worth watching the shortage in all behavioral health, not just substance abuse, is uh, a national uh, crisis and something that we will continue to follow here. Hannah Meisel of Capital News Illinois, Alex Degman of WBEZ, thank you both for being with us. Pleasure. Thank you. And thank you at home as well. This program is only possible because of your support. We appreciate you and your donations to keep public media strong in Illinois and the region. For all of us at WSIU, I'm Fred Martino. Have a great week.